Okay, so Ruth, tell us a little bit about the recent edited volume that came out. Uh, well, <clears throat> I edited a, vol a volume about right-wing populism in Europe, politics and discourse, with uh, Majid Kozravinik and Brigitte Mral. Majid teaches in Newcastle and Brigitte in the University of Erdru in Sweden. And we edited this book together uh, because we had a symposium in Uruguay in the year 2010 when I received an honorary doctorate there and also spent some time there as visiting professor. And that was the time when the Swedish right-wing party, the Sweden Democrats, suddenly gained more votes. And actually, for the first time, are now MPs also in the Swedish parliament. And people were very worried because the Sweden Democrats really have a fascist past. They draw on national socialist propaganda uh, quite differently than, for example, the Progress Party in Norway or the Putins in Finland. And uh, we wanted to understand why the right-wing populist parties across Europe are so as successful. Many countries, not all, but many countries. So um, out of this symposium, we made this edited book and also invited some other people who had not been present at the symposium because we wanted to cover more countries. And right now, we cover, uh, I think, uh, 18 countries, uh, from, from the United Kingdom up to uh, Norway, Greece, Hungary, Poland, Ukraine, uh, Austria, Germany, France, um, Denmark, Belgium, Netherlands, and so forth. Uh, and basically what is very interesting is that uh, most countries have such extreme right or right-wing populist parties except for Germany. Uh, and uh, that was one of the debates at the conference and we also take this up in the book because obviously due to the fascist past of Germany and to, due to re-education after the war, um, such parties don't have much chance in Germany. There is still a huge taboo in the public sphere to say racist, xenophobic or anti-Semitic utterances, which is different in the other countries. And what one of our major results, I think if you compare these 22 chapters, is that there is a huge difference uh, between Western Europe and former uh, communist Eastern Europe communist countries, um, which many uh, scholars neglect uh, and just talk about EU member states or Europe, but actually uh, forget that there is a significantly different political past due to the Cold War uh, and then also the changes after 1989. Uh, and thus, what we found well, is that in Hungary, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, uh, Ukraine, and we didn't do uh, the Czech Republic and Slovakia, but for pragmatic reasons, because uh, <clears throat> we didn't find somebody who was prepared to contribute, an expert, we found that uh, the chauvinism and nationalism is even stronger than in Western European countries. There is not as much Islamophobia or anti-Muslim beliefs, but much more explicit anti-Semitism and anti-Roma. Whereas in Western Europe, uh, anti-Tiganism or anti-Roma ideologies are not as prevalent, and anti-Semitism exists, but is frequently uh, tied in very complex ways to critique about Israeli politics. And it's difficult to distinguish how much of it is traditional anti-Semitism, how much 
of it is more recent um, generalizations about Israel or legitimate critique about Israeli politics. Whereas in Eastern Europe, it's very clear, very explicit, traditional Christian and racist anti-Semitism, particularly in Poland and Hungary. And do you think this reflects some broader changes in political practices? I think it does uh, reflect a lot of changes in recent years. First of all, due to uh, 1989 and the fall of the Iron Curtain, many uh, migrants from former Eastern European countries went into the West and then since 2004 the Big Bang and the accession of uh, Eastern EU member states, uh, there is a complete new diversity in many EU member states. Uh, secondly, since 9-11, uh, migration restrictions have become stronger and are legitimized by security measures. And in that way, uh, we have a very strong anti-immigration sentiment frequently coupled with anti-Muslim uh, beliefs. And that's one issue. And the second issue is the normalization, what I call normalization of the extreme right, that most parties have moved to the right anyway and have taken over proposals which they uh, rejected formally and have integrated them into their programs so that uh, even if the extreme right doesn't have as many votes, the programs have been implemented. So we, ha we have a normalization of uh, very extreme immigration restrictions and a detabuization of uh, prejudiced utterances. And how do you think the role of the politician has changed in the last few years since you've researched this topic as well? Uh, the role of the politicians, anyway, has changed in, in the recent decades, um, not only in the extreme right, uh, they, due to mediatization and uh, the role of media and the new media and the social media, so that uh, somebody who's not media savvy has actually no chance as a politician. Politicians have to become performers or have to perform in the media, not just rhetorically, as they always have to, and they have to, they have sort of a, a um, habitus like celebrity stars, and um, in that way, many of these right-wing populist politicians are quite charismatic figures who have learned very well to cope uh, with the necessities of our uh, media generation and are very clever in addressing specifically also young young electorate. Now one of the places where we've been observing this these changes is the United Kingdom with the recent rise of the UK Independence Party and the British National Party before then and also the media prominence of the English Defence League. What has been your outlook on that? Well, we followed uh, a lot of these debates and uh, I find that very interesting from a more distance perspective, especially coming from Austria where much of this populist rhetoric started with your Haider and we also speak of the Haiderization of Europe. Um, so, on the one hand, we have the BNP, which is small number-wise and has fallen again since they won two MEPs uh, in uh, the last European Parliament election, but then lost again in the national election. Uh, and that was, that the BNP is a, pure, a purely or clearly fascist party and draws on Mosley, on the Mosley National Front, and has uh, clear slogans from the past, and programs, and John Richardson is currently writing a book about the BNP, uh, drawing on Mick Billick's former huge study. So that is a small, really fascist party, even though Nick Griffin tries to masquerade and mystify that. 
but um, it becomes quite obvious I'm analyzing right now, that's not in the book, but uh, for a different uh, publication I'm analyzing Nick Griffin's um, interaction in Question Time in BBC uh, two years ago and it's very apparent that he uses coded language very similar to the Austin Freeman Party. So we know and it's easily to deconstruct uh, what is implied and intended. Then we have the English Defense League, uh, which is growing and which is quite similar to other one-issue parties like uh, the, the Dutch Freedom Party, uh, Wilders Party and other parties which only have uh, anti-Muslim uh, programs. So the English Defense League is oriented towards keeping Muslims out, uh, but otherwise they have no uh, programmatic stance, but they are quite prone to violence and uh, um, have become, have gotten quite big in recent months. Uh, and thirdly, UKIP is a more traditional party. Uh, the leader, uh, Farage, was a Labour MP who then left the party. He was also a television moderator, so he's very clever in using the media and he has this obvious um, habitus very similar to Haider and others of being tanned and well dressed and uh, sort of casual and uh, uh, knows how to play with the media very well. And their program, and they have had seats in the European Parliament for quite some time, their program is Eurosceptic. So they're completely anti-Europe, EU, which always resonates well in the UK uh, and resonates across all parties, actually, um, except for the Lib Dems, maybe. And also he is very, uh, they are also very much anti-immigration, but not in that uh, radical xenophobic kind of way. Uh, and they're anti-privilege, anti-big parties, so they are really very much uh, or very similar to other right -wing populist parties programmatically. And what we see right now is that they're gaining votes because the government uh, is um, losing in preference and uh, uh, people are getting frightened. So what is happening is very similar to what we observed about 10 years ago in Austria, is that the mainstream parties try to enact the program of UKIP, uh, hoping that people will stay and vote for them, uh, instead of realizing that they will always vote for those who really have that as the core of their program, uh, and really sort of uh, marginalizing such parties and staying with their um, other values. Uh, they come across as uh, opportunistic and they will certainly not uh, gain those voters which vote for UKIP anyway. Uh, and we've observed that in Austria and it seems like a déjà vu uh, experience for me watching a very similar uh, event or phenomenon happening again. Well, hopefully they'll learn their lesson. Well, we'll see. I mean, it's it's the question of what kind of debates take place and what kind of, if politicians succeed in uh, breaking this Gordian knot of specific rhetorical dynamics. Well, thank you very much, Ruth, and looking forward to having more discussion about this topic in Lancaster.